In the tradition of three approaches to psychotherapy one, with Dr. Carl Rogers, Dr. Frederick Pearls, and Dr. Albert Ellis. Three approaches to psychotherapy two, with Dr. Carl Rogers, Dr. Everett Schostrom, and Dr. Arnold Lazarus. to present, in part one of this third series, Dr. Hans Strupp, distinguished professor of psychology, Vanderbilt University, and author of Psychotherapy and the Modification of Abnormal Behavior, and co-author of Psychotherapy in a New Key, a guide to time-limited dynamic psychotherapy. In part two, Dr. Donald Meichenbaum, professor of university, and author of Cognitive Behavior Modification, an integrative approach, and stress inoculation training. In part three, Dr. Aaron Beck, university professor of psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and author of Anxiety Disorders and Phobias and Cognitive Therapy of Depression. And now our host, Dr. Everett Schostrom. In this, our third series, we are again presenting three distinctly different approaches to psychotherapy. I leave it to Dr. Strupp, Dr. Meichenbaum, and Dr. Beck to present their theories and systems to you in their introductions and the therapy sessions that follow. But there are characteristics common to each of these three approaches that are perhaps as significant as their differences and that are important reflections of where we are today in this challenging profession. Among the major challenges we face in psychotherapy are most simply what strategy or techniques will help to solve or improve the problem of the patient. What evidence do we have that the strategy will probably be effective? If it is effective, how or why? And how long will the process take? Dr. Strupp, Dr. Meichenbaum, and Dr. Beck are leaders in addressing the challenges in psychotherapy through their extensive research and in their concerns with developing and evaluating briefer forms of psychotherapy. I want to thank these three men and their client, Richard, for allowing us to share in their work and experiences. Now, part one, Dr. Hans Strupp. The approach to psychotherapy which my collaborators and I have been developing at Vanderbilt University is based on an interpersonal model. We have found it useful to view a patient's problems as disturbances in interpersonal relationships. We also place a good deal of emphasis on understanding the transactions between patient and therapist in the here and now. In a nutshell, we feel that interpersonal experiences, typically those in early childhood, have made a person sick. The purpose of psychotherapy is to provide a new relationship that can make the person well, or at least mitigate earlier damage. Together with Freud, I see psychotherapy as a form of education or after education or in Alexander's phrase, as a corrective emotional experience. In short, therapy involves learning, and we now have to ask, how does it work, and how does it come about? I think it can happen in two major ways. First, the therapist attempts to, attem uh, to create a good human relationship and to understand the patient's inner world. This is done through communication of interest, through caring, through respect, and above all, through empathic listening. The patient must come to feel secure and free to express himself or herself. Second, while a good empathic relationship seems to be a major healing factor in all forms of psychotherapy, it is often not enough. 
The problem is precisely that the patient cannot take proper advantage of what a good human relationship has to offer. This is so because as a result of hurtful experiences in early childhood, patients have developed maladaptive patterns of behavior which in adult life create serious obstacles in their relationships. Freud made the revolutionary discovery that people tend to transfer feelings, attitudes, and behaviors from the past to the present and to reenact with significant people in their current life scenarios that are rooted in troublesome interpersonal relationships that stem from the past. For example, a patient may relate to the therapist as a powerful parent figure and assume the role of a weak and dependent child. In this, and in many other ways, patients rigidly cling to the past and they do so by what I call cyclical maladaptive patterns. A major task for the therapist is one, to identify one of these patterns in the patient's life. Second, to bring it to the patient's attention. And third, to help the patient explore the ramifications in his or her current life. While such a maladaptive pattern may become apparent already in a first interview, it may take quite some time before it can be worked through and therapeutic change can occur. The therapist can be helpful in this because he or she is both a participant and an observer in what transpires in the patient-therapist relationship. As an observer, the therapist recurrently steps outside and comments on what transpires in the interaction. The therapist's own emotional reactions to the patient can also be of great value in therapy. They can also be at times a great hindrance. In sum, therapy involves learning, learning that is cognitive learning and learning that's experiential learning. That is, the patient learns to use the context of a good relationship with a sympathetic and empathic listener to acquire new or different patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting. Thank you. Hello, Richard. I'm Hans Strupp. I'd like to ask you what brings you here and how I might be of help to you. I just went through a divorce that uh, I did not want. Uh, my wife divorced me, and uh, I felt that uh, we could, should continue on as going through therapy. And uh, I'm having a very difficult time getting over the loss of my wife, the, lice, uh, the loss of our family, and also uh, selling of the home. I'm mm -hmm. quite devastated by it all. Can you fill me in a little bit about uh, how this divorce came about? Uh, we were married about five years ago and we were happy for the first two years and then uh, we just started drifting apart uh, through as I look back at it now is through lack of communications I feel was the most part of it uh, we would sit there at the dinner table and uh, just make small talk and talk about uh, immaterial things and we just drifted uh, further and further apart and and uh, we we both held the anger inside of us. We were angry at each other. We did not communicate at all. And we just drifted further and further apart. And then at that point in time, after we were married for about three years, we did uh, seek out some counseling. Mm -hmm. Did that accomplish anything? Well, what did it accomplish? Uh, the counseling <coughs> at that time uh, helped us look at each other. Uh, or we looked at ourselves, not at each other. We looked at ourselves. And I believe that both my wife and I are better people for going to this counseling. But this was individual therapy? Yes, it was individual therapy. We did not go together. 
Did you see the same therapist? Too? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we continue to go individually. And uh, then my wife came to me one day and she said that she thought it would be a good idea if we separated for like six months or a year and I would stay in the house and keep the house. And I agreed to that. I thought it was a good idea because we were just drifting further and further apart. And she moved out, took, a, uh, took an apartment. And uh, about four months later, we continued to go to therapy. And about four months later, uh, she came back to me and said that she would never be coming home again and that she wanted me to sell the house. And uh, that, uh, she felt it was completely over between us. Mm -hmm. So I was quite devastated by this because I did not want this divorce. And I put the house up for sale. It's sold within two weeks. And we closed that closed escrow within uh, six weeks. And I took an apartment and uh, hoping that, because uh, the house was quite a financial burden on us. It took two incomes to keep it going. And I moved into an apartment and uh, I would, then I would call my wife up and see if she wanted to date or we could continue on the therapy, but I wanted to save the marriage. And then uh, after I'd been in my apartment for about 30 days, she called me up and said that uh, she'd filed for divorce. What reason did she give for moving out? We just weren't getting on. We just weren't getting along, that was all. There, there were okay. no... What, what, were, what precisely happened? Or in what way did you not get along? We didn't communicate. This yeah, is, you this said is, that at the beginning. That, this is, that was a problem from the beginning. Yes, and it still is to this day. Right now, it's, it's still mm -hmm. to this day. We just did not communicate. Uh, we would be sitting at the dinner table, and I would ask my, my wife. I'd be sitting there, and I, would, and I could see she was angry. She was sulking. I, I would say, what's the matter? And she would say, nothing. Well, me being a nitwit at that time at myself, I would say, oh, okay, nothing's fine. So I would just drop it. I wouldn't pursue it. And then we would go to bed and get up the next morning and, and re, re, uh, repeat the whole scene all over again. And we just absolutely did not communicate, and we just kept drifting further and further apart. We, we never discussed our problems whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, our lovemaking started to fall off, and it was just lack of communication is all it was. We just, even uh, possibly uh, she would have filed for divorce anyway if... Uh, if we even if we would have communicated but uh, I, I feel so empty inside because we never really expressed ourselves to each other when you say that uh, she would sit at the breakfast table table and sulk uh, something must have happened the night before or the day before or the moment before um, <clears throat> there must have been some things that you did that she reacted to or some things uh, that uh, were, were going on between the two of you that the other reacted in in very adverse ways what what uh, comes to mind about that okay i believe part of it was that my wife did not think i was well educated enough for at that time for this the uh, social people that we were running around with at that time. I don't think she thought I was well educated enough. I am not a uh, college graduate. Uh, she was? No, she is not, but she has high ideas for herself. And uh, I think that she felt that uh, these groups that, that we were socializing with at the time, uh, she, a lot of times I felt that she was very embarrassed. Uh, she tried to protect me because I just wasn't an outgoing, vibrant pillar of the community type. I also think another thing that bothered her was that she made more money than I did. And I think that bothered her considerably. Mm. Did it bother you? Somewhat. It was, it was not overpowering to me because I, I felt that our love was holding us together. It was not a big material thing to me at that time. Yeah, I meant to ask you that uh, when you first met her, when you were first married, I assume that happened fairly soon thereafter? Or? We went together about two years. I see. There was a time when you were getting along pretty well, and these problems in communication, as you described them, 
did not occur or they were yeah uh, when when we first met we had a i guess a a, a simple uh, male female relationship uh, we were infatuated with uh, with each other i thought she was the most wonderful person in the world she was attracted to me because i was physically good looking and at that point in my in my life i did have uh, i was comfortable financially and uh, we at the we did seem to have a lot of things in common when we did get married mm -hmm. so there was a good understanding and the relationship was uh, harmonious yes initially yes mm -hmm. uh, my my wedding day was the happiest day of my life mm -hmm. you had been married before no this was my first marriage before, had she been married before yes i see and there, there were some children uh, my wife has uh, four children she has four children well getting back uh, to the difficulties that eventually led to the divorce, I, I would like to pursue a little more the uh, ideas that you were presenting about um, her feeling that you somehow didn't measure up to her expectations. Um, how, how did you feel about that? it made me feel very inadequate i uh i uh when we would go out to we went used to go to a lot of black tie affairs and uh and she would constantly cut in on my conversations uh, whether she was correcting me or uh she had something to contribute it didn't make any difference she would cut in mm -hmm. uh, i can remember one time when we went to a, a nice affair and there were about uh, four couples sitting at the table and the lady ex uh, ne sitting next to me ex expressed a political opinion and I disagreed with it. So I expressed my political opinion and then after, which er I made sure everyone at the table heard me, and uh, after it was all over, my wife announced to the uh, table that I always uh, played the devil's advocate, which I wanted to punch her right in the mouth for saying that. Mm -hmm. So you felt she was putting you down and you were angry. Yes. So how did that result in her sulking in the morning? And saying, when you questioned what's going on, you, she would say nothing. I, as I reflect back on it now, I'm sure that uh, she was angry with me because I didn't present the perfect image at the dinner table the previous night so it carried over into the morning and rather than us sitting down and discussing it mm -hmm. and saying what the heck is going on here she wouldn't say anything and I and I would just well, well okay I'll let it go I wouldn't say anything and then we would just and you would get angry and she would be angry yes and uh, we just didn't say anything about it I, we were just both hoping I guess that it would just go away by itself it didn't no what happened instead we drifted further and further and further apart the the touching the kissing the holding the caressing uh the intimate looks they weren't there anymore mm -hmm. and that's when finally it got to the point uh, i i could see there was a problem but but never never going to therapy before never reading any self-improvement books uh, always uh, just being basically interested in material things, I really didn't know how to handle it. I just didn't know what to do. Did you discuss these um, problems, this estrangement that was occurring between the two of you? I didn't get the impression, at least until the time that you went to see the counselor. Did you discuss these things at all? If there was any discussion at all, it was very, very limited. She wrote me... Uh, two or three this is while we're still married living together yes she wrote me two or three letters from time to time and uh, and would express her feelings partially express her feelings and, and but I would read the letters and then we would we would discuss them superficially but there was never what did she ne say in those letters yeah uh, she would be angry she was angry at herself for what she did um, you mean to criticize you or? yes she would be angry at herself for what she did and she would feel bad and so I took it as an apology 
And I would go to her and I'd say, gee, everything is, that's fine. I'm glad you wrote the letter. And, and we, would, we would talk about the letters superficially, but we never got to the real meat of the problem. Mm -hmm. Whose idea was it to seek uh, professional help? My wife's. And you went along? She, she felt that that would be helpful to uh, improve the marital relation. Yes, she went, when she first started going to the counselors, I think she went like three or four months. And she told me, I, I didn't even get the impact of the whole thing. You know, I, I almost had, like, had my head buried in the sand almost. Uh, she told me she's going to a counselor. Oh, okay, fine, great. Good, you need it. And, and uh, so uh, after about, she went to the counselor for like three or four months, and then she says, I want you to start going too. And I could see our relationship was just absolutely deteriorating. And so I said, fine, I'll go. I, I always referred to it as one flew over the cuckoo's nest because I was not crazy about therapy whatsoever at that point in my life. And I started going, and I could, uh, I, I could see the benefits that I was receiving from this. And I felt that if my wife was receiving as many benefits as I was, uh, we were going to pull this marriage back together again. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of any things that you might have been doing to aggravate the situation or uh, create, in part, the problems that, that arose? That is, were you doing, might you, be, obviously, you know, you couldn't do much about the income. Uh, you couldn't do much about the education. Somehow or other, she was disappointed in you. Uh, but might there have been something? You said you, you kind of rejected the idea of seeking help. Um, might there have been other things that uh, um, somehow made it worse? Uh, she complained to me several times that I was not uh, attentive enough to her. I did not caress her. I did not hold her enough. Uh, we did not make love enough times. Uh, she, she wanted more physical attractions. Mm -hmm. You said earlier you were rather uh, strongly in love with her. You, there was a strong attraction there. That, that had worn off for you? Initially, you yes. Initially, the, when we dated, and then, the, say, like the first two years of the marriage. And then we started drifting apart after that. Mm-hmm. So you felt, basically, that she was somehow disappointed in you or dissatisfied or displeased or in yes. one way or another. And uh, were you asking yourself questions as to what you might have been contributing to this or were con continuing to contribute to this? At, at that time, when I first started noticing uh, negative thoughts, my own negative thoughts towards my wife, um, I was telling myself that it was her fault. Yes. It's, it's not me, it's her. And when... Uh, the negative thoughts were what? She's just a bitch. Uh-huh. She you, screwed up. You were getting very angry at her. Yes. And uh, I was... When she, when she would criticize me, rather than calling it on her and saying, well, hey, you know, that's your opinion. Don't, if you want to express your opinion, fine, but that's not the way I see it. Rather, rather than discussing it and expressing your opinions, my attitude was, well, I'm going to get even with her. I'm going to get back at her. She, she criticized me at the dinner table one night. Well, I'm going to get her. The next Saturday night, I'm going to get her. I'm going to put her in her place. Have you had similar kinds of relationships in which uh, you were angry or your partner was somehow dissatisfied? Or was this the first time this ever happened in your life? Uh, up until I was married uh, to, to my ex-wife, uh, women were just more or less sex objects to me. I was, I was never really interested in getting married. They were just mm -hmm. dates, somebody for Saturday night, uh, I never, uh, I used, to, I would uh, go with a girl for two, three, four years until they started hammering me about getting married, and I, I wanted no part of it mm -hmm. until I met, uh, until I, I mean, met. Closeness, intimacy, other than physical, was not much of an issue. N no. You weren't looking for it, and you, you, it didn't seem to be important. 
to you? Am I putting no. words in your mouth? No, no, not at all. Uh, it, I knew there was something missing. All say that I dated for like uh, 20 years or whatever it was. I, I knew there was something missing, but I just never could reach down inside of myself and 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 come to say, "Hey, I love you." Mm -hmm. it, it was very difficult for me. So this was really the first time that uh, while you were married, you lived close on close range with uh, with a woman, mm -hmm. and uh, that brought about these problems that have to do, it seems to me, with uh, difficulties in, in intimate relationships and uh, where you felt uh, somehow put down uh, or in, in certain ways your partner was disappointed in you or, or there was a lot of angry in that change. I mean, there, there clearly was something basically wrong in the relationship that needed, I think, to be worked out. Yes. And uh, um, it's, I think it's also not uh, unimportant that uh, you had a number of sort of fleeting, shall we say, relationships or, or impermanent relationships. You were how old when you got married? 42. Uh-huh. And had you ever uh, war, uh, uh, been wondering why you hadn't married sooner, or did this just not... Uh... Uh, well, for one thing, I was looking for the perfect woman. I see. She had, had the perfect personality and the perfect body. And... Uh, They're hard to find. Yes, I'm going to start looking again, though, but I'm not going to take 25 years to find one. Uh, and uh, I finally come to realize that I put my expectations way too high. I've got to, I had to look at myself and see what, what, do, what do I have to offer. When Connie and I got married, I thought she was the most, uh, the, the, the most uh, perfect woman in the entire world. Mm -hmm. But apparently she had certain expectations of you, too, that you didn't meet. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it may have been a situation where both of you had very high expectations of the other, and you couldn't fulfill no. them uh, because both of you were looking for perhaps uh, the kind of people that uh, don't exist yes. or the kind of relationship that doesn't exist and you were sort of brought down hard to to reality uh, finding out that, that you had shortcomings that y she had shortcomings and uh, you somehow were weren't able to to come to terms with those uh, several months ago, I eluded this to the counselor. I, 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 when I went in to see him one day, I said, you know, I feel sorry for Connie. I mean, I was filled with anger and hatred at this time. I mean, I was really mad at her. But I could still bring to myself, as, you know, I feel c sorry for Connie because I think she's looking, possibly looking for the man that, is, that does not exist. The man that's, that's perfect. And mm -hmm. I just don't. Think she'll ever but by the it. same token, you're also looking for the woman that perhaps doesn't exist. Yeah. Well, you know, the next you Saturday night, you never know what happens. Anyway. You, you're not quite convinced that that's uh, <laughs> uh, impossible, <laughs> that, that maybe you need to examine some things there about, uh, uh, well, whether the kind of partner you're looking for can be, can be found. Interestingly, too, that at first, uh, your wife was that ideal person, but then uh, things went downhill, and apparently they went downhill also as far as she was concerned. She felt dissatisfied, and yes. you weren't meeting her needs, and she felt uh, uh, you know, the other way around, too, that mm -hmm. is you weren't meeting each, each, other's, each other's needs. Well, I've been asking you a lot of questions. Are there any questions you want to ask me? How are the Commodores going to do in football next year? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I wasn't ready for that. I have a lot of questions to ask you. Uh,
where where do where do I go from at this point in my life? Um, how do I get started? I want to get started. How do I get started again? I'm da I'm depressed from the from the divorce. Uh, I don't have a woman in my life. My uh, my uh, uh, I feel that uh, my job is beneath me as as what I'm doing right now. I just I should have better. I should have a better job. I live in a crummy little apartment, which I hate. I admit my I admit, I want a house. I want I want all the things that I had before, and and where do I get started? How do I get doing this? Uh, you lost some of your, you lost a job, and you lost. I, I've, uh, I've had uh, three or four jobs last year, mm -hmm. and we sold the house. You know, I'm starting all over again. What do you attribute these? What did this? How did this come about? The job loss. The uh, uh, one of them, I was laid off. I knew it was coming. And I got laid off on that one. Uh, one of them, I was. I only had it for two months, and I got fired. Uh, Did I, you get angry on the job, or you get into conflicts with people on the job? Well, that was a matter of opinion. I put my fist through the wall one time, but I thought it was just showing my expression. They they, they took it as being angry. Uh, the, the woman that I worked with, I was in real estate at the time, and there was two of us. We were in new home sales, and there were two of us in the sales office. And uh, this woman and I, uh, she was quite uh, quite vocal, just a loud mouth. She, she was a bitch, as a matter of fact, that's all she was. And uh, we worked together for a while. And, uh, you used that term to describe your wife, too. Yeah, well, I could just about use it to describe all women right now, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we got along okay for a while. Uh, I did put my fist through the wall one time, one day in the sales office, but it was an accident. Mm -hmm. Are you pretty uh, explosive in, in your dealings with people in general? Uh, I, I was at that time. I was very depressed, very angry, and uh, very upset. Just And to work with this particular woman, who I, to this day, I still don't like her. She's Mm -hmm. not a good person and uh, so she went finally went to the sales manager and uh, behind my she never this is the thing that really irritates me she never discussed with me our problem she never came to me once I went to her two or three times uh, which I was proud of myself at the time because I never could do this with my wife I went to her two or three times and I, I could see there's a problem I said you know there's a real problem here let's talk it out and uh, she would, she was really rude with me. She wouldn't talk about it. She was uh, uncommunicative. And I said, you know, then I said, well, that's your problem, man. You're screwed up. And uh, so anyway, we started, we started this gal that I was working with. We started drifting further and further apart. And uh, then uh, she went to the salesman. Without ever discussing anything with me, she went to the sales manager and told him that uh, I put my fist to the wall and uh, I was an SOB to work with and so forth and so on. And he called me in and fired me. And I was very unhappy about that. That, that was one of the jobs I had. And, uh, well, I certainly understand you've had a lot of disappointments in, in your recent life in particular. And uh, earlier on, too, or has this... Uh, yes. You, you nod your head. Yes, I believe uh, my problem started from my childhood. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I think that would be valuable to go into also because, you know, it did, this didn't start yesterday. No. And it didn't start the day before. Mm -hmm. And it's not likely to, you know, terminate tomorrow. I, I think it would be very helpful to you to find a therapist to work with and examine what the things are that you might be contributing to or that lead to the kinds of difficulties that you have found yourself in. And I think that um, this is a good time. I think that the, the fact that you uh, are at a point that you are uncom uncomfortable, that you are feeling kind of crummy about yourself and, and the world uh, would be a good time to, to take up uh, this unfinished business and and look at at the totality of your life it may take some time to do that and I think that it can be done and there's help available and uh, I realize that you know financial considerations play a part but I 
certainly would encourage you to find a competent therapist and, and, and stick with it. Uh, I have a sense you, you probably would. Yes, I, uh, now that uh, I've finally been introduced to therapy, uh, I am very high on it, and uh, I am irritated at myself that I never, uh, never received some type of counseling or therapy when I, when I was in a young person in my 20s when I really needed it the most at that point in time, rather than all my education or night school or whatever I've, whatever I've done in my life, I've always leaned towards uh, how can I make more money. I read uh, business magazines, and uh, when I went to night school, it was strictly related to business and, in and increased my income. Uh, half of that time should have been devoted to uh, self-improvement and therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, our time, unfortunately, is running short, but uh, I'm curious, uh, is there any one thing you said it started from day one? Is there any one thing in, in your childhood or growing up that you attribute um, your major difficulties to and anything in particular that come to mind? Uh, the lack of affection and love as a child and also that and being alone and being an only child. Mm -hmm. uh, lack of affection from? From my mother and, and father. Both parents? Yes. Mm -hmm. Lack of affection and then when I, re when I received no love and affection and being an only child I, I didn't have anyone to talk to. I spent an awful lot of time by myself as a child because they, they were alcoholics. I spent an awful lot of time by myself. I, I, I had a dog and a teddy bear, and that was it. And you have so, any, any friends? Uh, even as a youngster, I had a difficult time making friends because at that time, uh, even, even as a child, I think I had a lot of anger in me mm -hmm. and very few friends. But uh, at that, I, I learned... Uh, I didn't learn. I got off on the wrong foot in life by not communicating as a child, and it just carried over as the years went by. Mm -hmm. I think you have certainly some pretty good understanding of some of the history. And uh, is this something that was occurring in therapy, or that was that you arrived at in therapy? Yes, these just about everything that that I know of therapy is what I've learned in the last year. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Thank you for coming in. Thank and you. And enjoyed talking to you. Wish you lots of luck. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'd like to comment briefly on the interview with Richard uh, that was just completed. I'd like to make a few comments about this man and his impression that he made on me first. It's pretty apparent that here we're dealing with a very angry and a very depressed and a rather hostile man. We can also understand something about his recent disappointment, his wife having left him, uh, the uh, divorce, and uh, his feeling of uh, being rather abandoned and alone. It was difficult for me to uh, get a clear picture of what this man's recurrent patterns, maladaptive patterns are. Uh, we got a glimpse of that toward the very end of the interview when he uh, talked a little bit about his deprived childhood, the lack of affection and tenderness and closeness in his parental home. And I do believe that we're that's where his difficulty certainly originated from. I dwelled a good deal on the uh, relationship with his wife because of my uh, conviction that uh, interpersonal relationships are the area that need to be explored, and that's why I spend a good deal of time on that. I didn't get a very clear picture of uh, what happened in this marriage, except that uh, here are two people, probably both of them rather self-oriented, rather narcissistic, and who uh, were clashing because they were not capable of uh, intimacy. And I think that that's this man's basic problem. He is not capable and has not been capable throughout his life of intimate relationships, of closeness, 
a fear of closeness, no doubt, but also a difficulty that results from that. So here we have a man, I think, who is basically rather empty, uh, who uh, uh, displays a certain bravado, who uh, displays the role of uh, hail fellow, well met, but it is uh, superficial. Complicating also are uh, this man's uh, volatility, his tendency to be explosive, and uh, his search for the ideal mate, the ideal companion. And he sees himself as kind of a, a person who's uh, uh, concerned quite a bit with show, and he's looking for this ideal object. And he's so, so he's going to be disappointed as life goes on. I see him uh, at this time in his life, in his 40s, as someone who's coming up against a crisis, their recurrent disappointments, and they are rooted in his character, uh, his whole history. He has never been able to form a close, intimate relationship with a woman, or perhaps with anyone. Uh, the question might be asked, how would I deal with this man in therapy, if he were to see me in therapy? And there again, I did not get a very clear indication of what this man's maladaptive patterns are. I do believe that over a six month period, perhaps in once a week interviews, and he seems to be motivated, quite a bit could be accomplished in exploring what his interpersonal difficulties are, what he does, what he is looking for that leads to disappointments, and uh, what uh, might be done to help him to uh, form more uh, satisfying, harmonious relationships with uh, other people. But I see this as a rather long drawn out and a rather protracted uh, undertaking. The very fact that I was not able to get a very clear picture, a very succinct picture would suggest, to me at least, that we're dealing with a rather deep-seated, long-standing problem, which often is referred to as narcissistic uh, personality disorder, uh, he is simply unable to relate to people in a, except in a very superficial uh, sort of way. I uh, felt that uh, any further exploration would take us into therapy and I would certainly want to learn more about this man's past, his interpersonal relationships in the past that proved disappointing. The most recent one, certainly, with his wife, who left him in the recent past, is an area where we need to deal with uh, what he did to her, what she did to him, what his expectations are of her, what her expectations are of him. And I think it was quite apparent how disappointed both were. They apparently were both people not capable of close relationships. But it's the area of disturbed in their personal relationships and the recurrent patterns, the maladaptive patterns, that are of primary interest to me in working with a person like that uh, in psychotherapy. I don't think he's an ideal candidate for short-term therapy or perhaps for any kind of psychotherapy. There is the question of his impulsiveness and uh, his uh, anger and the question of how long he would stay in therapy if he were to get into therapy. But at the same time, I think there is also a lot to be said on the positive side that would suggest that uh, he might make progress and that uh, psychotherapy definitely could help him and I would certainly want to give it a try. As for my own reactions, which I find uh, always interesting, I really didn't come to any clear feeling. On the one hand, uh, I felt empathic with his difficulties, and at the same time, perhaps partly because of his basically narcissistic orientation, I did not feel very close or could not empathize with him very well, as I don't think he was very empathic to me. So there's a kind of superficiality that beclouds this inner emptiness that the man is suffering from.
Cognitive behavior modification is an attempt to integrate the clinical concerns of psychodynamic therapists on the one hand, of cognitive semantic therapists, with the technology of behavior therapy on the other hand. It tries to build upon what the research tells us about the nature of behavior change, about the communalities that cut across different therapeutic procedures. It's not an eclectic nor muddle-headed approach. It, it grows out of some very basic theoretical positions about the nature of maladaptive behavior and a theory of behavior change. Let me comment on each of those. From a cognitive behavioral perspective, behavior, uh, the behavior that a client brings to us, our own behavior, is a reflection of, of different kinds of processes. Part of it are the kinds of thoughts, beliefs, internal dialogue, images, the way in which we appraise the environment. It also is reflected of the kinds of feelings we have, as we'll see. Sometimes those feelings are dysphoric. It's also a reflection of the kinds of behavioral patterns that we emit over and over in different situations and, and the reactions that occur from significant others. That is, this is a recursive process, and each one of those come into play in contributing to the way in which we behave. Now, it will be our job as therapists to make individuals aware of the contribution of each of those processes, to make the client aware that they're not merely victims of stress, that the way in which they appraise events and their ability to handle those events, the way in which they behave may often inadvertently contribute to the very problems they have, the very solutions that people employ seem often to help maintain and exacerbate their problems. Those are the processes that we're going to be looking at. Moreover, what leads someone to change, no matter who they see in therapy? Uh, from a cognitive behavioral point of view, the notion is that people have certain kinds of beliefs about themselves and the world, and that these views color the way in which they appraise situations, the options they take. Now, out of the strength of the relationship that emerges in therapy, people develop, the therapist helps to nurture the courage for people to try something different, to perform personal experiments in active routines. These events lead to reactions from significant others. The job for the therapist, we'll see, is to help the individual take those reactions and view them as evidence. Like scientists, clients don't often take the data as evidence that will unfreeze their beliefs. This kind of learning experience doesn't occur overnight. There are no quick fixes, no remedies. I, I get concerned about the kinds of protestations that clients often make, given the enthusiasm, the charisma, the personality style of the therapist. 
I'm much more concerned about what is maintained over time. What has the client learned? Before I comment on uh, the goals and styles and techniques of this technique, let me introduce one caveat or warning. It's important to appreciate that cognitive behavior modification is not a panacea. While there's encouraging data for a number of these procedures with a variety of populations, it's important to appreciate that it's just an informative stage and still evolving. And often has to be supplemented by other techniques. What are the goals of cognitive behavior modification? Well, first of all, it's to bolster a flexible coping repertoire on the part of the client. There's no one way to cope. There's no remedy, no formula for dealing with the problems of living. Secondly, there's an attempt to help the client develop a sense of responsibility about the problem, a, a sense of empowerment, a sense of efficacy about their handling it, a sense of coping. The, ther the client has to learn that, get a feel for that what they're going through during the course of therapy is what Carl Rogers in, in one film called a, an irreversible experience. But together, I as the client's coach, as educator, as collaborator, try to figure out how we could work together to find out how they could achieve their goals. There's another part to this educational process. To make the client aware of the transactional nature of their behavior, how their own appraisal processes, the way in which they skew experience as they perceive it. The patterns, searching for the patterns with the client about their thought processes, the way in which they behave. But that entire collaborative effort becomes the basis of the change process. Moreover, it's important that the therapists ensure that the client have the skills to perform those personal experiments. This educational process is in no way a lecture. I've been a professor teaching college students too long to appreciate the limitations of what students or clients take away from lectures. Rather, the style is one of collaboration, a kind of Socratic approach. Uh, uh, perhaps you're familiar with the character of Peter Falk playing Columbo, <laughs> a sense of the way in which I try to use my own befuddlement, amusement. <laughs> At times, I play dumb. It's not that difficult, not only for me, but for often other therapists sense of not having to be the expert, but working together with the client. I'm wondering, to begin with, if you could just start off by giving me a sense of uh, the kinds of problems that you have that bring you here. Maybe tell me a bit about yourself and so forth. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm very depressed over the divorce that I just went through. Mm -hmm. I'm very angry at my wife. I did not want the divorce at all. I wanted to see if we could work out our problems. You hadn't been married prior to this? No, this was my first marriage at 42. And how long did you remain married? We were married uh, four years. And um, could you tell me about the circumstances that sort of led to the divorce? <clears throat> I think uh, both uh, myself and my wife were terrible communicators. Mm. We didn't communicate our feelings. You say that you were poor communicators and that you really weren't able to share your feelings? Yes. Is that with your wife or does that occur now in other situations as well? It, it still occurs somewhat. I, I have been going to some counseling uh, this past year, mm -hmm. and uh, the counselor has been working with me and my, with my anger and helping me express myself and get my and express my feelings. Uh, and I am much better at expressing my feelings now than I was when I was married. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about sharing your feelings right now here in these sort of circumstances? I think it's great. Uh, I, I, f I felt that, uh, that I've been sheltered, uh, or I've sheltered myself. I haven't communicated uh, with society. I've, I've been practically a loner all my life, and I've, I've never had a lot of friends. And, uh, and I've never 
done any therapy at all, done ever, any self-improvement books, and, and I've, I really feel I've missed out on life. And I, and I think this is fine. I don't care where this film goes. I think it's great to express myself now. What I, I am kind of curious about what what would lead you, motivate you to sort of participate in in, in this in, in this project. It was an opportunity to show the world that hey, this this is not a bad guy. He's mm -hmm. all right, because I've made a lot of enemies in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been uh, uh, sarcastic, uh, mm -hmm. rude, cutting, and I've really been an angry person. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel like this is almost like an opportunity to apologize to the people that I've stepped on down through my life. What I'd like to do is sort of get a sense of um, these behaviors. You, you said you were angry, sarcastic, and so forth, and now making the film would provide you with an opportunity to say, no, no, uh, I'm not such a bad guy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there other things that you might be able to do in your day-to-day -day experience to convey that same feeling without having to make a film? I mean, are there other things that you might yeah. try Yes, when I, years ago, when I used to work in, walk into a shop, a print shop, mm -hmm. in my profession, and I, my attitude was that uh, if you want to be my friend, you've got to come to me. If you want, you've got to come to me and talk to me and say hello to me. That, was, uh -huh. that used to be my attitude. And I would notice that, uh, that not too many people would come to me and say hello, how you doing, what's going on today, let's go out for a beer after mm -hmm. work. And now, today, after, t after going through ther therapy, for, when I walk into the shop now where I'm working, I go up to people and say, hey, how you doing? What's uh -huh. going on? I open myself up to people. Uh -huh. So and that's a change that you've, you've yes. made. Yes, I'll open myself up to you and say, I'll be the one to say good morning, rather than waiting for the other guy to say good morning to me. Uh -huh. And what, how does that make you feel now? That it makes me feel much better inside. I, I feel so, so much better as, as we sit here and talk. I feel, I feel free about talking about these items. They don't bother me. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, I, I would have sat here like this with my arms folded mm -hmm. and kind of glared at you. And, and I wouldn't have been responsive yeah. to, uh, to your questioning whatsoever. Mm. These feelings uh, about sort of being more open, feeling that you're getting a handle on things, I guess is how you're describing it. Where else, the, what are the things that you feel you still have to work on? I, st I still have a lot of depression over mm -hmm. the divorce, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of anger towards my wife. And I think the anger and the depression are the biggest things that I must work on right now. I, I feel that, I really don't even know why we were divorced. Uh, all I received in the mail from the uh, attorney was uh, irreconcilable differences. Mm -hmm. And I called my wife up and said, what, what the heck are irreconcilable differences? And, sh and she wouldn't discuss it with me. Mm -hmm. She just said, we're not compatible, and that was the end of the conversation. I think now I, think now I want to continue in therapy with my wife and I being there with the, with the therapist and find out exactly what happened in our marriage and, and eliminate those anger feelings. I'm, I'm a little bit confused by a couple of things you said, okay? And maybe you can help clarify that for me. On the one hand, you say that you're not sure what led to the divorce. <laughs> I mean, there the paper arrived. Yes. But yet, a little while ago, you mentioned something about other factors that might have contributed to the divorce. I guess, as you put it, there were not communicating, not well, sure. And I guess I'm kind of wondering how you see those two going together. I, I, I'm speculating. I have some ideas, what I think, which caused my wharf, uh, wife to, to file for divorce. Uh, I'm not real sure. I want to hear it in her own words. Mm -hmm. I think I know why, but I want to hear it in her own words. I want us to get together and talk it out. Mm -hmm. And what's her attitude towards that whole... Uh, uh, we've been talking about it for a couple of months, and we've been kind of been playing cat and mouse with it. 
well, you call me. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. You, well, I don't know, you know, well, what's going on here? And I, I think uh, probably, uh, I think we've come to an understanding now within two or two, probably within a week or so, two weeks, we're going to get together with a counselor and mm -hmm. see if we can't resolve the but hurt. What do, you, what do you hope to achieve there? You're talking about resolving the hurt. And I, I want to hear in her own words why she divorced me. And I, and I want to express my anger to her over what's happened over the last four years. At that session? Yes. Tell me about what does it mean to express your anger? What, what, what would that look like if I... I've, I've got it inside of me right now. It's bottled let, up. Tell me, let, let, let's look at that bottled up feeling. I've, I have the, I want to hit. I want to punch. I want to swing. I, I, I'm... Hurt. I want to hurt. I want to, uh, when somebody cuts in front of me on the freeway, I want to run over them. If they cut in front of me, I want to hit them with my car because they got in my lane. Mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, I want, and I, f and I feel that, uh, I want to get it out of me. And get it out of you? I, how, uh, how will... I want to ex express my anger at my wife. I want to yell at her. I want to mm -hmm. scream at her. Mm -hmm. And... and how will that yelling, that screaming, help? The, f the first thing that, c that came into my mind was a, was a blown up balloon. Okay. You blow a balloon up, it's about ready to pop. One yep. more puff and it's gonna blow up. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden somebody and it lets all the air out. That's and you and, feel and that I feel balloon? that. And as we sit here and talk, I'm just thinking about. It, I'm getting angrier and angrier. One kind of concern that I would have in working with you, Richard, is to find out what are the different ways that are available to handle those feelings of being depressed and angry. Clearly, letting it out, letting that balloon go, is one way. What I'd like to explore with you is what is the impact of letting it out on that, on others? And what else, are there other ways to handle the anger? What triggers the anger? How long has this been going on? There are a number of questions that I think our examining together would be helpful to look at the anger, the depression, and what you could do about it, what you have been doing about it. L let's start with, if in fact, after some reluctance, you were able to get your wife and you to come together with the counselor, and you let the balloon go, as you describe it, what kind of impact would that have on your wife? on your relationships. From the little communications that I've had with my wife since divorce, she feels like a rat. I mean, she feels like she let me down. She, she married me and she divorced me. And she feels that she is not, she feels like she's a bad person because she took the family, basically, she took the family away from me, the house that I love. She did all this stuff. She feels bad about that. And I, and I feel that she, communicating with each other, with, with the counselor, I'm sure that the counselor, or I hope, the counselor would make her feel better. Look, you're not a bad person. You could not live with Richard. Maybe Richard ain't so great after all. You cannot live with him. You've got to put your pieces together and get going again. That's what I think she would get from it. Mm -hmm. The thought of her, right after we, we moved, she moved out of the house, and then I sold the house. She took uh, a condominium, and I, and I got an apartment. My, my, my heart ached so much. My, my stomach was just twisted in knots, thinking of her sitting in that, in that, in that condominium by herself. I was just all torn apart. 
because they want what's right for her. And then, and, and, and so I hope that she would get that, she would eliminate that feelings of feeling, feeling like a rat and she's a good person. And what I want to get out of it is just this anger that I have towards her and this anxiety so I can get on with my life. Because mm -hmm. I, 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 many days I get so damn mad at her, I just, if I could see her, I'd want, I would never do it, but I want to punch her right in the mouth. Mm -hmm. I get so damn angry at her. On the one hand, I get the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's a lot of caring. The feeling that you have right now, the welling of the eyes, and the teariness, the, the concern. But yet, on the other hand, there's a lot of anger. Yes. A lot of that she... I, I'm asking myself today, should Connie and I really be married? And that, that was a tough, the first time that question popped into my head, that, boy, that was hard for me to deal with. Because I didn't want this divorce. I didn't want the, the family to go. I didn't want anything to go. I wanted our relationship to improve and for us to live happily ever after and be married. I didn't want anything to end, and I thought we could do it, but she felt different, so she moved. Take a moment. It's okay. There's a lot of feelings. Yes. Let's go back to a question that I asked before. If you meet with her and the counselor and you let the balloon go, if you vent all that anger, all that emotion that's welled up, what would I see? I and mean, what form would it take? I mean, could you play through what I, I, I feel that uh, I would be more at peace with myself. This what would I see? What, I mean, what would happen in, my in, in the session? Would there be... I, I would just let go of the anger that I have inside of me right now. The, I, I will, I'm hoping to hell the anxiety would dissipate and that you would see a, a, I wouldn't walk around with that little, that little sarcastic glint in my eye wanting to punch everybody in the mouth. Mm -hmm. The I people would, who cut in front of you on the expressway, the right. people who don't come over and ask you out. Yes, and I would be an open and free person, ready, ready to communicate. Okay. Um, I am trying to understand and maybe you could help me. If there are any other ways, what other ways you try to deal with that anger? Are there other ways to express the anger either to your wife or to other people? Express the anger. Any, I've how else do people handle anger? Besides just letting I'm balloons go. Besides well, smashing cars in. One outlet is I, when I run, I, I, when I jog, I jog, I jog till I almost drop. Uh -huh. But I mean, with someone else, let's say someone else has done something that irritates you. You know, they press you. And, you know, they don't meet what you think. They don't behave the way you feel they should behave. And you get angry and pissed off. How, how does one handle that? What do, you, what do you do in those? Give them a piece of your mind. You tell us. <laughs> Tell the son of a bitch to go to hell. I mean, come on, Richard. What do you mean? I cut in front of you. Don't honk your horn at me. Kick your ass, you son of a bitch. I'd like to see you try it. I'm getting to wonder how serious you are here. I guess I'm wondering, Richard. What else is there to do besides kicking one's ass? when people don't. Shut up! You could yell. That's clearly one thing. Besides kicking ass and yelling, what else could one do? Show love. Show love? When you're all pissed off and the guy cut in front of you, you're gonna show love? 
What does that mean, show love? Reach out. Yeah. Are there other things one can do besides kick ass, yell, show love? Understand that the other person is just a human being? Yeah. Like you. And you even talked about it at the beginning. Perhaps there are other ways to express feelings. Of letting people know what it is about what they've done that you find so upsetting. You know, Richard, when you do X in situation Y, it makes me feel Z. Are you aware that you did that? I mean, is, is that a way that you might be able to communicate with your wife? I mean, I guess one of the things that we would do in future sessions would be to understand what it is that triggers your anger. What's common among those different situations? Have you... I'm, ha I'm having a problem right now where I'm, where I'm working. Uh, the fellow that... Uh, I run a machine, and the fellow that runs the machine right next to me, we, we're almost at arm's length, like, okay. just like you and I are, right, okay. all night long. Uh -huh. And the guy talks all night long. Just keeps going He's got diarrhea on. of the mouth. Right. And he goes on and on and on. And... It just grates on you. Yes, and first I was, I said, what in the hell have I gone to counseling for if I haven't learned how to communicate? Uh, and I, I got down on myself because I wouldn't say, hey, look, Jim, let me talk to you about this problem. You're talking all night long. Uh, first that went through my head, and then, uh, then I was going to take, take him outside and punch him out. No, I said, that's not good. That's not right. And then, well, I'll just turn my back on it for a while. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll go away. It'll go away by itself. And then, then I went to, got to the point where I said, well, he's just a human being. Uh, the guy is he's kind of a screwball. And uh, I'll just uh, take him for what he is, and uh, I don't, I won't get, he talks, and I listen, and then I walk away. So I'm tolerating him a lot better right now. Mm -hmm. But I'm still disappointed in myself that I have not communicated to him what's bugging me. Right. So the fuse is still short. Yes. And given the right circumstances, it can go like that. Yes. And the question is, how do you communicate with someone that what they're doing bugs you, but without turning that person away? Yes. I mean, how do you tell your wife, how do you tell this guy that there are things that they do that irritate you, that bother you, but that you don't violate the whole relationship? This is, this is what I'm afraid. I mean, I don't really care if Jim is a friend of mine or not. I mean, I'm not going to socialize right. with this guy. So I don't really care whether he's my friend or not, but still, he's a human being. I don't want to hurt his feelings. I don't want to be in one of those situations where we work three feet each from right. each other and we don't talk all night long. That's yep. disastrous. So I've asked myself many times, how do I communicate to this fella and get my point across, but not alienate him completely? Okay, I mean, that's a very reasonable request. And I think that in therapy, in subsequent sessions, we would work on exactly those skills. Not only with him, but is there a way to relate to your wife in a similar fashion? Is there a way to relate to other people without turning them off? It seems to me that there are alternatives. And that's what I want to find out. And I think therapy can clearly help you not only find out about those things, but it also actually work to implement them, to change them. I mean, you have a lot going for yourself. There is one other question, one other observation that you made that I'd like to pursue a little bit, if I may. You said, not only do you feel this anger, but you also feel depressed. Yes. And I'm wondering if you could share with me a bit about that depression. Uh, 
the depression is the loss of everything that we've mentioned, including my wife and everything. The depression is also that I do not have a female companion right now. I desperately miss the love of a woman, the touch, the way they place things in the house. I miss so a you woman. you feel lonely. I'm very lonely. And I'm, and I'm also to almost to the point of uh, panic or anxiety because I have had 10, I don't know how many dates I've had this year. I lost track of them. But I rarely do I call a woman back up again because I just haven't been able to find anybody that I really felt that I was, it fit what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. Looks, personality, position. And I'm starting to get a little panicky. But will I ever? Of course, I realize it's only been a, it's been a very short time, sure. but I'm starting to get panicky uh -huh. about that. Yeah. And it sounds like you have a shopping list and you can go around. <laughs> is that, is that a, uh, a shopping list? I mean, uh, of, of the features that people should fit. I mean, you have this list yes. of... Yes. She's got to be good looking to begin with. Yeah. And she's, got to, she's got to turn me on physically. Okay. And uh, she's got to be educated. Mm -hmm. So you have to, not only that, I mean, you have to establish some kind of relationship with these people. Yes. Yeah. Tell me a bit about the depression. How, how bad off is it and when does it occur? And uh, it's uh, peaks and valleys. I think uh, the worst time is when I'm sitting at home by myself on... Uh, uh, I had just uh, done the wash. Mm -hmm. I've just uh, cleaned the house. And uh, the football game was just over, and the Ram, or no, this wouldn't be a Saturday. The, okay. the football game would be over, and I just, uh, my team just lost. And uh, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I've got my food shopping done, and I've got absolutely, and I don't have a date, and I have absolutely nothing to do, and I don't feel like reading a book. Okay. And I get, sit around, I get very depressed, I get feeling sorry for myself. And uh, am I going to commit suicide? And, and just get very depressed. I just don't. Commit I don't feel like talking to anybody. Com commit suicide? Um, tell mm. me about a bit about that. How that uh, that thought has entered into my head. Committing suicide. What are the thoughts that you have when you're sitting there? And. Well, the, the, the first thing, first thing I get thinking about is uh, what will I write in the note? How will I fill the note out? And who will I, who will I address it to? Uh, or will I address it to anybody? Or will I leave a note? Do I even want to leave a note? Screw the world. They're all a bunch of son of a bitches anyway. And I get thinking about that. Then I get thinking about getting my gun. You have a gun available in the house? Uh-huh. I have mm -hmm. two of them. Mm -hmm. I uh, think about getting my gun, and uh, and then I get thinking about the mess that it'll leave. I, w I would never commit, so I'm going to do it with a gun, see? Mm -hmm. And I would never do it in the house because it leaves too much of a mess. So what you've got to do is, I've got a garage in this apartment where I live. So I'm going to go down the garage, and I'm going to nail up uh, plywood boards on the wall and on the floor. So, and you see, you have to also, you can't go like this because you might miss. You might get shaking so bad. You, you, you got to put it in your mouth. You got to put it in your mouth and pull the trigger. Well, when you pull the trigger and, it, and all your brains go shoot, so they'll hit the plywood wall. And, and avoid a mess. And avoid a mess, right. So when the people come in to clean up, all they have to do is pull the plywood down. Very considerate person. Yes. And, well, wait, I'm not finished yet. Oh, okay, go ahead. And also, you put a big blanket on the floor, too. A big, heavy blanket so it absorbs all the blood. And so when the people come in to clean up, all they do is take the blanket and the throw it together and take it off and they're gone. Let me ask you something unusual. What prevents you from doing that? Uh, that the people that I leave behind will think I'm weak. That there are people that care about me. Mm -hmm. They've told me this. Mm -hmm. And I don't 
want to leave this world that way. I wouldn't want you to leave that way either. I mean, even though you're lonely, it sounds like you're not alone. That people do care. You've been through an awful lot. You had a situation of a marriage breakup, changing of a job. There may be even other stresses in your life that are all coming together at this time. And I am seeing that some of the reaction that you're having, the depression, the sadness, the feeling of hopelessness and at times even helplessness may in some sense even be a natural reaction to what you've been through. I mean, that doesn't make it have less of an impact. But on the other hand, I, I feel a kind of, how should I put it, a, a real desire to live, a sense of realizing new potential, of, of wanting to change. Yes, that's very true. And it won't be easy. Okay. I feel at uh, my age right now, which I'm 47, I, f I feel almost like I've been reborn again. Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start a new career very soon. Hmm. And uh, in, two, in two years from now, I'll, I'll think that the, the marriage was okay for a while. In fact, I was going to write my wife a letter. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, thank you for coming into my life. And then I was going to fill it in all in with about mid four million words of everything that I'm angry about. And then the last sentence would be, thank you for leaving my life. And I, I think this is a very difficult time right now. And I, and I need therapy. What would you thank her for coming into your life for? I mean, what are the things that she's done that you're really grateful for? She's a wonderful woman. She has, she has uh, initially, not in the last two years, but initially, she taught me love, uh, compassion, uh, some understanding. It was, it was beautiful being with a woman, never, not have to call somebody up and get a date. She was always available. She was there. She was a good housekeeper. We had a lot of fun together initially. And, 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 and my, my wedding day, uh, which I'll, uh, even though I, I have a hard time with that right now, but I can say my wedding day was the happiest day of my entire life. And she, she taught me an awful, awful lot of things. Okay, that was then. Maybe, maybe we weren't supposed to be married. Maybe, okay, fine, it's over. But that's why I would thank her for coming into my life. What did you bring to the relationship? What did she learn from you? What did you have to give? I don't think I gave her anything. Nothing. If she was sitting here, what would she say she's learned from you? What did you give? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't... I don't think I gave the relationship anything. What do you have to give to those other women you want to meet now? Because I, I, have, I have learned love. I have learned that even though my next woman is not perfect, she will be my next woman. And I can all overlook her slight imperfections. Well, that's really and kind of you. Thanks, Sucker. <laughs> <laughs> and the anger that I, that I held with Connie for the first few years of our marriage and that have now are, are coming out of me, 
I really want to touch and hold and feel and caress the things that she cried out for and I didn't give to her. Ooh. I, uh, let me just give you a few kind of summary comments, Richard. First of all, I appreciate your openness and your willingness to sort of share, not only with me, but in this setting. I've learned a fair amount about you during the course of this time. And in future sessions, if we had an opportunity to work together, I would try to explore with you a bit more about the nature of your anger, <laughs> the kinds of things that trigger it and alternative ways to handle it, both with regard to this person as well as with your wife and other relationships. I think you have a lot going for you. <laughs> and I think it would be a loss if the depression got so overwhelming so that it colored the way you see things. I think that with the help of therapy, you can not only learn to relate to people in a constructive way, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with expressing anger. I don't want you to get that wrong. But there are ways to express anger in ways that don't turn off other people. I'd also want to explore with you the nature of the depression, the kinds of thoughts and feelings that surround it, and what triggers it, what results in it sort of getting better. And, and I think that as you develop these relationships, there may be times down the road when you might get depressed or angry, but that going through therapy will in some sense be an irreversible process. That is, while those problems might occur again in the future, you'll be a different person. I want to thank you for enriching my life by having you share your experience. Thank you. I feel somewhat comfortable with what happened, but yet a little bit frustrated. I'd really like to see Richard a lot more. I have a number of important questions and areas that were not covered. I don't have a sense of the history of his pattern of behaviors. There's no sense of development, or history, the background. Some of the data we had had to do with his family that time didn't permit me to explore and the pattern of these relationships. I also didn't have a clear sense yet of, of the patterns of his behavior. Uh, although it emerged as he described the situations in which he became angry, a lot more work would have to go into looking at the patterns of behavior and helping him become aware of how he inadvertently turns off others, whether it's the many women he's dating, whether it's the person he's working next to, whether it's his former wife. To help him appreciate that he's not merely a victim of the way in which these people react. I also get a, need to get a better sense of, of the kinds of expectations he has, what advice he would have for others, and what has he been trying. That is, before each intervention would be offered, and a fair amount of cognitive behavior modification has been directed with people who have anger, especially the form of stress inoculation training and so forth, a lot more groundwork has to be laid. There's a need to explore the patterns of his thinking in terms of what are the events that trigger his behavior. Not everyone who cuts in front of him on the highway. Not each person who provokes him elicits anger. One needs to help him develop a more differentiated view about the nature and function of anger. The other kind of topic that we got into, and I thought it was an important one and telling one, was not only the anger, and he felt it here. I mean, when he yelled and screamed, one can feel the tension. And as I mentioned in the introduction, there's a necessity to have people feel so that this isn't some kind of intellectual exploration. And Richard felt. I felt. The other part was, was the nature of his depression. I was taken and struck 
by the sense of helplessness and hopelessness. The, the amount of detail that he conveyed with regard to the suicidal ideation. One might want to assess in some kind of psychometric way the level of depression, the degree of hopelessness. The clinician needs not to avoid that difficult issue. One needs to monitor this over the course, especially as he starts to perform personal experiments and there will be setbacks. How we anticipate and subsume it. One wants to make sure that the nature of the depression doesn't get out of hand. One starts to work as I began, to start to reframe the kinds of events that he's experiencing, the kinds of thinking styles that he engages in. I mean, one either lets everything out or you avoid. Where's the gray area? Richard needs to explore that. You either sit alone, you get depressed, or you're happy go lucky. Where's the gray area? And what leads to that kind of behavior? There's a lot of work to be done with Richard. As I mentioned, I, I think that he has a lot going for him. I wasn't trying to be Pollyannish in any sense. I, I do think that he has a number of strengths and that he has benefited from therapy. I'm a bit concerned about his over-enthusiasm for therapy as the answer, the cure-all. I don't want him to be persuaded by some convincing therapist. I want him to learn the skills that will lead to him to relate differently, to gain the insights, the awarenesses that we all benefit from. The one thing that I'm most disappointed in is that I won't have an opportunity to see Richard again. Cognitive therapy is a system of psychotherapy. It consists of a theory and an organized body of principles for applying this theory to the treatment of patients. The various principles involved in the theory. The major principle is that the way an individual perceives his reality will influence the way he behaves and the way he feels and the way he approaches his problems. Consequently, if he misperceives reality, then he's going to have aberrant feelings, he's going to behave in a maladaptive way, and he's going to have difficulty in solving his problems. Underneath this type of misperception, we often find there are many distorted beliefs. In depression, the beliefs center around a negative bias towards the self. The depressed person perceives himself in a negative way. He sees himself as a loser. As he looks back on his past, he thinks of himself as a failure. The present is filled with predicaments and the future with futility. In contrast, the anxious patient may not see himself in a negative way, but he sees himself as surrounded by dangers, and he believes that he is not able to cope adequately with these dangers. The paranoid patient in contrast, sees himself as the victim of abuse, persecution, intrusion, blockage, frustration, and the like. 
all of these disorders have a particular type of thinking disorder. First, there is selective abstraction. The individual fastens his attention on a few significant details in a particular situation, but he ignores all of the other details. The depressed patient, for instance, may only perceive those incidents in which he fails or does not live up to his standards, and he misses all of the very positive aspects of a situation. Second, the individual may jump to sweeping conclusions on the basis of minimal or inadequate information or data. Third, the individual tends to overgeneralize. Thus, if he makes a mistake in one situation, he may believe that he mistake, makes mistakes in every situation. Finally, patients in these disorders tend to show all or nothing thinking. For instance, if a depressed patient is not totally successful, he is likely to see himself as a total failure. Now, how do we apply these theoretical principles to the actual therapy situation? Actually, the theory is a kind of a blueprint which we use in order to organize the information that we obtain from the patient. This blueprint helps us to understand the patient better, and it also enables us to select those tech tactics and strategies that will enable us to treat the patient. The main objective in the therapy is to try to adjust the patient's biased thinking in such a way that it conforms in a more regular and accurate way to the actual external reality. Now there are many techniques that we use in cognitive therapy. First and foremost, it is important to establish a good working relationship with the patient. This is something that we call collaborative empiricism. The patient and the therapist work hand in glove, testing out the patient's belief, evaluating them, seeing whether they're accurate or not, and modifying them according to the requirements of reality. Secondly, the therapist uses questioning in order to unravel the mystery of the patient's problems. This is something that we call guided discovery. The patient and the therapist try to work to ascertain just what the distorted thinking is, and then they attempt to evaluate the distorted thinking. There are many ways in which one can evaluate conclusions that a patient makes which do not seem to conform to reality. First, one can ask, what is the evidence for your conclusion? Are you leaving anything out? Are you omitting contradictory evidence? Does your conclusion follow logically from the observations that you have made? And finally, are there alternative explanations that may be more accurate in explaining a particular episode? The ultimate goal, of course, is to correct the patient's misconceptions. Once they are corrected, the depressed patient becomes less depressed, the anxious patient becomes less anxious, and the paranoid patient becomes less paranoid. What do you feel about being here? I'm very nervous. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, my stomach is turning. Uh, I think my palms are starting to perspire a little bit. And uh, I am concerned about uh, how well I'll come across mm -hmm. if, uh, if, if I can maintain my uh, faculties to uh, communicate, keep a good conversation going. Now, do you remember having thoughts of that nature? Uh, will I come across well? Will I be able to carry on a conversation? Will I be able to perform properly? Did you recall having had those thoughts? Uh, the closer I, I got to your office, uh -huh the more severe the thoughts got. And as the thoughts got more severe, what happened to your symptoms? The anxiety, the stomach, the sweaty palms? Um, my, uh, my stomach started to churn more and more. I felt a lump in my throat. Uh, I found it uh, very difficult to breathe. Uh -huh. So in addition to the stomach, you had other physical symptoms, such as a lump in your throat and some problem in breathing. Yes. Now, can you see any connection between these fairy, fearful thoughts that you had and the symptoms that you're experiencing. They, they, they run together. Uh -huh. They, they're just, I'm just, I'm almost like 
jelly. Yeah. So one of the things we want to look at is to see whether this type of thinking that you do produces the types of effects, both psychologically in terms of the anxiety that you feel and also physically, the uh, funny feelings in your stomach and the sweaty palms and the choking sensation that you get. We want to see if indeed the thinking produces the anxiety symptoms. Now, if the thinking isn't reasonable, if it's way out of line, you can correct the anxiety symptoms by correcting the thinking. For instance, it might very well be that it doesn't matter how you perform here. And if you could be convinced that it doesn't really matter, that it's my job rather than your job, then you wouldn't feel anxious anymore. That would help, yes. Uh-huh. So let's look at it right now and see if it's true. Whose responsibility is it to carry on the interview, yours or mine? Yours. Right. And what's your role? M my role, I'm here to gain knowledge and uh, help me with my anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm here. Right. And so your role is simply to be able to answer questions and performance or being nervous and so on doesn't at all interfere with giving us information because your nervousness itself is a form of information, isn't it? Yes. So the responsibility isn't on you, is it? No. Right. And the question of evaluation isn't on you either. No. Right. Now, what do you think would be a more reasonable way to put your role in this particular interview? I am to respond to what you ask me, but I also have to be honest with you, because if I'm not honest with you, then you won't be able to feed it back to me. Right. Now, does the anxiety prevent you from being honest? No. So you can be honest whether you're anxious or yes. not. Honesty has got nothing to do with performing, performing well, carrying on a good conversation, being a polished speaker, and so on. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay, now that we've gone through that and restructured your role, uh, how are you feeling? I feel better. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm, still, uh, I'm still anxious, but, right. but I, I feel more comfortable so, now. Well, you can see when a person changes his thinking from something that's kind of exaggerated, such as I have to perform well, to I just have to do whatever comes my way, you can see when the thinking gets modified, then the emotions do change. So let's see how this develops now in terms of your major problems. Now, what is the reason why you're coming for therapy at this time? I just went through a divorce, mm -hmm. and I'm, uh, I'm depressed, and I have a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Now, first, what I'd like to do is look at your depression itself. Is that okay? Yes. So let's, let's examine the depression and see just what it's made up of. Uh, now, on what basis do you think uh, you can make the diagnosis that you're depressed? Uh, I, I have that terrible feeling in my stomach that I am just very lonesome mm -hmm. and that I will be alone for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And at this point in my life, no one wants me. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems that your depression then is made up of the fabric of several conclusions. One is that you're lonesome. Number two is that you're alone now. Three is that you're going to be alone for the rest of your life. And four, that nobody wants you. So this is the way you see your life situation in a very negative way in terms of you and other people. Yes. Now, how do you view yourself? As you look at yourself, do you see yourself in glowing positive terms? I, I feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. And I feel that uh, after the divorce, uh, with, a, with, a new, uh, with a new position, with a new company, that I'm ready to get started in life all over again at, at age 47. But it still does not eliminate the loneliness mm -hmm. of today. So the major thing that seems to bother you is your loneliness. Yes. Now, as you look back on the past, how does your past history seem to you? Stinks. Uh-huh. In what way? you feel your past history stinks? Because uh, I was very lonesome as a child. I had no brothers and sisters. Uh, my parents were alcoholics. I made very few friends as a youngster. 
and I felt that uh, from as far back as I can remember, I, I have always had a shell around myself. I've always kept everyone at arm's length. Mm -hmm. I would never get close to anyone. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, uh, did you feel that you made a success out of life, in, say, the last five or ten years? Uh, I made, when I got married uh, five years ago, I felt it was a tremendous emotional experience for me because I, it was my first marriage and uh, here was a woman which I felt at the time was the most wonderful woman in the entire world wanted mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. and that made me feel very good about myself at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as, uh, now, but now we're going back through the divorce again, I'm, I'm back uh, having some doubts about myself again. Mm -hmm. And now as you look back on your past, how do you view yourself? I view myself as a product of my childhood mm -hmm. and it wasn't my fault mm -hmm. that I was that way as a, as a right. youngster. And, and how do you feel then this childhood development has affected you, say, in recent years? Uh, as a child, I spent um, my, practically my entire childhood by myself. I received virtually no love as a youngster. Uh, being an only child and my parents drinking a lot, uh, I had no one to communicate to, and there was, there was a lot of fighting in our family uh, with my mother and father, because I would just hide in the yeah. bedroom. And it, it made me a very, very sheltered person. Yeah. Now, sometimes when people have a childhood like that, they reach certain conclusions about themselves and about other people. What conclusions do you think you have now that may have originated back there? How do you see yourself now? in terms of the childhood experience? After uh, going through some counseling this last year, I feel good about myself now. Mm -hmm. And prior to going through the counseling, how did you feel about yourself? I was a goddamn jerk. Uh-huh. So you regarded yourself as a jerk, and in what ways were you, quote, a jerk at that time? Um, hooray for me and screw the world. Uh-huh. Uh, I had a lot of ang anger in me. I, I looked at, uh, I didn't try to look at the positive side of people. I always looked at their bad side. Mm -hmm. And I was very negative. And I had an attitude of, uh, I'm going to get them before they get me. Mm -hmm. So up until you started the counseling, you had a lot of attitudes about other people. Yes. Which was kind of, sounds kind of competitive, dog eat dog, is that yes. right? What? And it was like, who's superior and who's inferior? Yes. And I'm going to hold people at arm's length. Yes. And at that particular time, the loneliness did not bother you? It, yes, it did bother me. Even so? It bothered me then. I didn't know any better. I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. where, where do I go to change, to change into being a good human being? How do I get started? Mm -hmm. I was very, I've been very lonely all my life. But I, either I was too stupid, or I just didn't know what to do to, mm -hmm. to get started on the right track. Yeah. Now, you think that this kind of standoffish attitude that you had, being aloof from other people, uh, set you up for being a lonely person? Like, before you started the counseling, you say, I'm going to step on these people before they step on me. This idea of seeing people as in opposition to you do you think that that might have affected you in terms of your relationships with other people? Oh, yes, by all means. Yes, sir. Um, I can see, in the, just in the last six months, I can see a different attitude uh, of people towards me. When I go to someone and I'll put my hand out and I'll shake their hand and I'll, and I'll radiate warmth mm -hmm. and love and kindness, uh, whereas before, it was uh, who's got the strongest grip mm -hmm. and don't look me in the eyes you son of a bitch because I'll stare you down. Now, how strongly do you feel this other notion, I don't want to hop on it too much, but it does seem to be at the core of your depression as you said, that you've always been lonely, you always will be lonely, nobody wants you and you're never going to be able to find somebody who will want you. How strongly do you believe that? I don't believe it at all. So you don't really believe it? No. Uh, so on the one hand, you say it, but on the other hand, you don't really <laughs> <Yes>. believe it. 
It's when, it's when I'm laying around the, the house by myself, uh -huh. and I have absolutely nothing to do. I've got nobody to call, uh -huh. and uh, I'm just, it's Saturday afternoon, and I have no date, uh -huh. and I've got nothing to do, and I just, what am I going to, nobody wants me. I have to start feeling sorry for myself. I see. So when you're actually in an isolated condition, then these thoughts come up. But right now, when you look at these very same thoughts, you don't believe them. No. You don't. Now, let me play the devil's advocate. Why don't you believe them? Because I feel now, at my age, I, have, I am maturing, and I am becoming a good person, and I have something to offer to society. And since you are maturing, becoming a good person, and you have something to offer to society, what does this tell us about the probability of you finding somebody that you can be close to. Excellent. So right now, you, are you still feeling depressed? No. I'm, no starting right this feel, minute. I'm starting to feel better. Okay. Now, what's going to happen when you're lying in bed, it's a Saturday afternoon, it's kind of gray outside, nobody's calling you, you're all alone. What are you going to be thinking then? I, uh, there's a real good chance I'll be depressed. Uh -huh. Very good chance. And you're going to be thinking thoughts like, I'm all alone, I'm always going to be alone, and nobody wants me. Yes. And what are you going to do about it then? I've got to call somebody. Okay, one thing is you can call somebody up. Yes. And what will that, if you call somebody up and that person responds positively, what will that tell you? It tells me that somebody cares for me. That's right. Somebody cares for you. In other words, your belief is wrong. And has that happened, that sometimes you had this belief that nobody cares for you? You called somebody up and you got some positive feedback? Yes. So you've already demonstrated to yourself the belief is wrong. Yes. At times. But one demonstration doesn't do it. One swallow doesn't make a spring, right? You have to keep demonstrating it to yourself. So the next time, when you're home alone, well, Saturday afternoon, and you get this belief, you can test it out by calling up somebody. But suppose that person isn't home. What happens? You just go back to lying in bed and... Then I'm, then I'm very hurt. Yes, yeah. that's happened. I'm hurt. I'll try calling somebody else. And yes, this has happened. I'll call three or four people. None of them are home. They're all out. Mm -hmm. They're doing something. They're, they're having a good time. Yeah. And I'm sitting at home by myself. Yeah. And so you feel hurt. And what do you think? What thought makes you feel hurt? I think that that person doesn't care because they're not home and they didn't call me that day. That's right. First of all, they don't care because if they really cared, they'd be home waiting for your phone call. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And secondly, if they really, really cared, they would be on that phone calling you. Yes. Now, is there any other reason that they might not call you besides your explanation that they don't care? Is there an alternative explanation why a person might not call you? They're busy with their life. And, and, and they, some of the people that, that I have communicated with over the last year or so feel that uh, you can only support someone for so long and then they have to do it on their own or well, they have to take more initiative but okay now let's see this may be helpful to you because your big problem is these gray saturday afternoons when you're alone so could we do a little bit of a role play and let's imagine that um i'm you it's saturday afternoon and i'm kind of lounging in the bed and i'm having these thoughts and then you tell me what my thoughts should be, or see if they're incorrect and how you might correct them, okay? Now, here I am, home all alone. I don't know. Nobody has called me all day. That's awful. That means nobody cares for me. How are you going to answer that? People do care for you. You have lots of friends. I do. Who, who are some of my friends? I can't think of any right now. Don? Oh. Jim, Jim, the other Jim, Dennis, Steve, all the guys you play golf with. So that's only Don, Jim, Jim, Dennis, Steve, 
That's not so many. Is that all? No, we've got two other guys that we play golf with regularly. Yeah, what's their name? Uh, Steve. They give you Steve. And there's another Dennis in there, too. I know two, I know two Dennises, uh -huh. and I know two Dons, and I know two Jims. Well, if they really cared for me, how come they aren't calling? That's what I ask myself, too. You're supposed to. Yes, I know. Last night. Uh -huh. the, so we, we'll go over that again. If they're not calling, is there any other explanation why they might not call? They're busy with their own lives. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, is that reasonable, that they're busy, they have lives of their own, and that if you want to become part of the lives, you have to take the initiative? Is that right? That's what you should do, yes. Mm -hmm. You should take the initiative. Oh. Okay. But I still don't know what to do. I'm lying right here and feel nobody loves me, nobody's ever going to love me, and uh, maybe I'll go live in a cave and eat worms. Why don't you, uh, why don't you put on a pair of jeans and a shirt, brush your teeth and comb your hair and take a shower and go down to El Torito? What you're saying is that there are ways in which you could really counteract this negative thinking that you do. Mm -hmm. And you just showed an example of this right now. Now, do you think that it's possible when this occasion comes up again, and it's bound to come up again, that you can reason with yourself just the way you've been reasoning with me? Yes. Okay, so that's part of what we call cognitive therapy, which is trying to modify people's erroneous views. What, turn, what it turns out is that uh, the views that you have of yourself are erroneous. You do have a lot of friends. I thought from the way you were talking, you didn't have a friend in the world. <laughs> now, I guess if we polled various people, we'd probably find that you have as many male friends as uh, anybody. And you have good times, you play golf with them, yes. and so on. Now, the other part of your problem, though, that seems to bother you is that at the present time, you don't have a woman in your life. Yes. And evidently, having a woman in your life uh, is very important. To you, having a woman means what? Having a, like a steady girlfriend, someone mm -hmm. I don't have to call up and ask them out right. every week. She'll and, and when you have this woman in your life, uh, what do you think it's going to do to you? It will give me someone to hold and caress, which will make me feel better mm -hmm. because I, I want to express my love now. Am I correct in saying that you seem to believe that having a woman, the way you describe that, means that you're going to be happy? I think that is initial step for me uh -huh. to be happy. Yeah. So having a woman means happiness. And not having a woman means unhappiness. That seems to be a formula you operate on. Yes. Well, let's examine this and see if the history shows that. Now, when's the last time you had a woman in your life? During your marriage, I suppose. My marriage, which was, uh, I haven't, Connie and I broke up. Uh, it had to be a year ago, about mm -hmm. approximately a year ago. And since that time, uh, when we first broke up or separated, I had an awful lot of dates, mm -hmm. lots of dates. Uh, most of them were one or two dates. And I couldn't find a woman that I found attractive or uh, I felt was uh, socially on my same level. Yeah, so you had a difficult... Uh, transitional period. Now, how about before you split up with Connie? Well, just like the week before, the month before, what, were you feeling real happy then? No, we, we were going through a counseling that time, and we, about the last year of our marriage, year and a half, uh, we were both pretty unhappy. Uh -huh. So, when, at least we do know, for at least a year and a half, you had a woman in your life and you were unhappy. So having a woman <laughs> yes. in your life doesn't necessarily equal happiness. Now, let's go back in time and see. There were many years before you were married. And were, were there periods of time before you were married when you did not have a woman in your life? Yes. And how did you feel then? I felt I was lonesome then. Mm -hmm. Did you feel depressed then? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And were there ever any periods when you were neither lonesome nor depressed prior to marriage? Yes. Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 
having a woman in your life isn't an absolute necessity in terms of being happy. It's not knocking it right. Yes. We're just saying it's possible to be happy without having a woman in your life. I can, I can be a whole person myself. Right. Without a woman. And being a whole person is really what you have to do. You can't be really dependent on somebody else to make you into a whole person. Let's think about that for a minute. I, I understand what you're saying. And I, I feel I'm on the right track now, for the most part. I feel good about myself. I can be a good person. I am a good person without a mm -hmm. woman. But I miss them. Mm -hmm. Missing them is part of human nature is to miss something that you want. But missing them isn't quite the same thing as feeling that they're so essential to your survival that you can't exist without being depressed in the absence of a woman. Now, what you just seem to tell me is you can be a whole person without having a woman. In fact, you might get there faster without the woman because you can learn to stand in your own feet. Yes. Yes. So if one of your objectives is to be a whole person, to be independent, to be strong, to be mature, and so on, you might be able to get that without having to make a quick commitment to a woman. I went, uh, after I had all these series of dates, which uh, I just didn't care for over a yeah. period of six months. And in fact, I just quit asking women yeah. out. I just wasn't interested in them anymore because I couldn't find what I was looking for. All of one month there, just when, so some period of time, all of a sudden I, I did feel good about myself. I felt good about myself and I was satisfied sitting home. I wasn't depressed. I wasn't, uh, didn't have a lot of anxiety. I didn't, I didn't feel, feel the need to, to go out and grab the first chick off the street corner or something like that. I did feel good about myself for about a period of a month, uh, maybe two months. And this was right before the holidays, which I was kind of proud about myself because I was devastated by the fact of going through the holidays with, without, a, without a female friend. I just didn't want to spend... Uh, so I did have a period of about 30 to 60 days there where I just really didn't need anybody at all. But now the last, uh, last 30 days, mm -hmm. the, 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 the old depression feelings, mm -hmm. the anxiety, the loneliness that nobody wants me is starting to creep yeah. back into me again. So you're able to overcome that belief that you need a woman in order to exist in a happy way. You really need to overcome it temporarily. Yes. But you no longer believe it, and indeed you were happy. Now, reasonably happy. Yes. Now, if you have the notion that in order to be happy, I have to have a woman, what kind of a position does that put you in? It makes me dependent on a woman. Right. And it means that if you don't have a woman, that the form is going to have its day and you're going to be depressed. Mm -hmm. But if you can change the form around to it would be desirable and nice and enriching to have a woman, but I can be happy without a woman. Then what does that do to you? It makes me a complete person. And when I do meet the woman, eventually, someday, she will respect me more. Right. And so you'll be more independent, in a sense, and you'll be in a more mature level. Now, it may be very, it may be the case, though, that something's happened in the past month that made you slip, because sometimes that happens. Was there anything that's occurred during the past month that may have slid you back into this negative thinking? N no, I, I, I'm just, I just missed the touch. Uh -huh. I want to touch their skin. There wasn't anything? Was there any other relationship that you have that's uh, being threatened? No. Uh, my, my grandmother's dying, but I don't, I don't relate that to me, that's two different things. Mm -hmm. my, my grandmother raised me, well, for the most part. I was bounced around from one house to another. Uh, my grandmother is in the hospital right now, and we don't think she's going to pull out of it. Mm -hmm. Does uh, that have any effect on you, the fact that... I, even though my grandmother is very close to me, I, uh, I want her to die. She's old. I see. She can't 
So take the loss care of, of that relationship is not really affecting you now? Uh, no, I, I don't think that has anything to do with my own personal depression or anxiety yeah. at this time. Well, then we want to look at one other thing. And that is, you said that at times you've gone through these periods of anger. Is that anger still a factor in your life? Uh, some of it is. I'm, I'm still very angry at my wife. Mm -hmm. And um, what's the basis for your anger? What, remember, we had some automatic thoughts that you had that seemed to lead you to feeling anxious, like, how am I going to perform today? It would make you depressed, like, I'm a loser. I'm never going to find somebody. What kind of thoughts do you have in connection with your anger? I'm angry that my wife divorced me. When she divorced me, it took everything away from me mm -hmm. that, that, that I got when we were married. Now, you feel that Connie has taken everything away from you. That's the thought that you get. Yes. She's taken everything away. So let's examine it. Is there anything left? I get the barbecue set. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have material things. We split the furniture 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, I have embarked on a new career. Mm -hmm. How about the children? They're, since they were here, children. Uh, uh, I am. I am going to. Sh she is being very good about that. She has encouraged the children to stay in touch with me, and encouraged me to stay in touch with the children. Right. So now as you look at it, is it really true that she took everything away from you? She took away the things that were most important to me. Mainly herself. Pardon? She took away herself. Yes. But she's still allowing you, in fact, encouraging you to have contact with the children. Yes. So it's not a total type no. of takeaway. No. The other thing is you make it sound as though this was something she deliberately did just out of pure cussedness. Do you think that's... No. the reason why this happened? No. She did it because she was unhappy mm -hmm. and she didn't want to be married to me. Yeah. And when people are unhappy, oftentimes they do things that are either damaging to themselves or to other people. And one of the things is we don't want you to do anything that's damaging to yourself because you're unhappy. Have you thought at all of damaging yourself in some way? Yes. I thought of suicide. Mm -hmm. How often have you thought of that? Uh, it's generally about, uh, probably one Saturday afternoon a month. Uh-huh. Okay, now the next Saturday afternoon when you start getting the suicidal thoughts, what are you going to say to yourself? I'm going to tell myself that people do care about me. That they're you have to name names, right? Yes. You can't just say it in the abstract. Yes. And? Well, I didn't think you wanted all the names, right? No, no. <laughs> but this is just to instruct yourself. Yes. You've got to name names to yourself then. And what else do you have to say to yourself? Uh, that people do like me. People do care about me. They don't want me to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I have something to offer to society. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what you have to do is counteract the negative thinking with reality, because none of the things you just told me are untrue. They're all true. But you have something to contribute. Now, the final thing you might just want to consider is that although Connie did take many things out of your life that were present before, she did not take the most essential thing away from you. She did not take you away from you. Yes. Uh, a year from now, or two years from now, I don't know when the time will be after this is all over, and I've got both feet back on the ground again, Mm. this will be a tremendously good experience for me. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a big spirit towards your maturation. Yes. Well, we've covered a lot of territory today. Do you have any questions on any of the things that we touched on? Uh, no. I, 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 I can see myself it, telling myself, convincing myself that... Uh, when I'm so depressed, because I, 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 I know what it's like to be depressed, and you're, you're sitting there telling yourself, well, gee whiz, I'm really a good person, and uh, mm -hmm. gee, I have all these friends and everything, and, and I kind of have doubts about that. 
Yeah, you mean uh, how it's going to work. How it's going to work, because I, every time uh, I say something, gee whiz, you've got uh, 14 guys you can call and, and shoot the bull with, uh, but, then I'll, but then I'll hit it back with something negative. Yeah, well, and this is what I was trying to do. So I can't answer all of your negative things in such a short period of time, but I can teach you how to do it. Yes. And what you have to do is get a paper and pencil, probably even before this depressing Saturday comes on, you ought to put down some of these rebuttal statements that we've had just now so you can take them out. And then when you get the counter rebuttals that'll come up, but if they really like me, why don't they call and so on, then you have to be prepared to use the same skill that you showed here today in answering your re-rebuttals. So work on that and see how it, uh, how it progresses. Well, I'd still be interested in one thing before we finished with today. How did you feel about what we covered today? I, f I feel uh, very good about it uh -huh. uh, because uh, I really have not been trying to combat the situation when I get depressed. Mm -hmm. I just kind of lay around the house, watch TV, have a beer, coke, kind of lay around, lay around, wait for, wait till I get sleepy mm -hmm. and then go to bed. Yeah. And hopefully when I wake up the next morning, I'll feel better. Sure. Well, how do you feel now? At the beginning of the interview, you said you were feeling very queasy and anxious. Yes. Which may have been related to the interview itself, but you also did look rather sad. How do you uh, feel right now? I feel good about myself, and uh, I feel that uh, we could continue this uh, conversation for another hour if we wanted to. Great. Good. Well, thank you for coming in to see me. All right, thank pleasure. you. Okay. Well, okay. in this interview, I tried to demonstrate how one could apply the blueprint, that is the cognitive model of depression, as a way of understanding the patient's problems and helping him with them. At the very beginning of the interview, I tried to show the patient how his fearful thinking about the interview was leading to his feeling anxiety symptoms, uh, physical symptoms, and various psychological symptoms. The patient was able to see, at least, that the negative thinking, the fearful type of thinking that he was experiencing, was related to the anxiety symptoms themselves. This was really important because it meant that the patient could see the connection between cognition and affect, between thinking and symptom. Having demonstrated to the patient that there was some connection between the thinking and the anxiety symptoms, I then moved into a discussion of the patient's depression. The patient initially talked about his loneliness, which ultimately he related to kind of a deprived, barren childhood in which nobody really seemed to care for him and which eventually led up into a somewhat aloof, lonely adulthood. This background probably did help the patient to form certain negative beliefs about himself in the outside world. For a large part of his life, he was largely uh, aware of how the beliefs influenced him, his attitudes towards other people. He lived a kind of dog, eat dog, highly competitive, dominant, submissive type of relationship with other people. As the result of that, he did not get a great deal of very positive feedback from the people that he had contact with. This type of belief that people have to be kept at arm's length probably prevented him from developing the type of social skills that are necessary for an individual to form some type of permanent bridges with other people. The result of this was that the loneliness got perpetuated. In recent times, however, he has been making some progress in this particular way. And uh, it is very interesting to find uh, that he himself feels that he has matured a great deal ever since he started the counseling. The loneliness, however, for reasons we weren't able to quite establish, had a resurgence approximately a month ago. And he now finds that in particular times, such as Saturday afternoons, when there is nobody around to give him reassurance that he is indeed liked, he falls into certain very fixed beliefs. One of the beliefs is that 
I have nobody. I don't have any friends. Another belief is nobody cares for me. And a third belief is that I will always be lonely. Now, while he's sitting here talking to me, he can see that these beliefs really don't hold much water. However, there's every likelihood that once again, when he's alone, there will be a recrudescence of these beliefs. Consequently, I tried to teach him a few skills in dealing with them. These skills won't in themselves annihilate the beliefs, but they will give him some kind of a foothold uh, in order to be able to counteract them. As a way of promoting this type of skill training, I played the role of devil's advocate, and I had him answer me. Now, the chances are that this would not be sufficient for him to be able to rebut the negative thinking when he's in a highly depressed state. But if he does follow through with his homework assignment, which is to write down the rebuttal type statements prior to becoming depressed again, it is likely that he will be able to utilize these to some degree at that particular time. Further, I tried to emphasize the importance of developing this skill, and he did seem to be quite cooperative in that way. The skill of being able to evaluate the validity of his negative thinking, and then, if they seem to be invalid, to come up with a more appropriate interpretation of reality. I also tried to test his assumption or belief that he needs a woman to be happy. This type of belief, unfortunately, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the patient believes that a woman is necessary for his happiness, then when a woman isn't present, he will, as a consequence, start to feel unhappy because that's the way things should be. So I tried to produce some evidence. First, that there were times in his life when he did not have a woman and he was happy. And secondly, there were times in his life when he did have a woman and he was unhappy. The major thrust of all of this is to try to teach him a greater degree of independence so that having a significant other person is given its due importance but doesn't become a matter of life and death. And speaking of death, I then tried to touch on uh, what is always a potential danger in patients who are depressed, and that is they are likely to be suicidal. And I did give him a few cues as to what to do if he got so depressed that the suicidal wishes would come up again. And basically, the thrust would be to try to undermine the suicidal wishes by looking at the beliefs that are feeding into them, by attenuating or vitiating the hopelessness, the suicidal wishes will start to become attenuated themselves. Finally, I did ask him at the end of the interview how he was feeling, and uh, he did say that he felt less depressed. It's possible that this may have been a byproduct of the interview itself, whether the interview was indeed responsible for his feeling depressed or not, at least he does have one thing that he can take home with him. He now has a repertoire of cognitive skills that he can apply at times in the future when he is either depressed, anxious, or angry.